Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Funky Brain Podcast. My name is Dennis, and this is my funky brain. There's a lot going on up here, but I'm feeling better than I used to. So that's pretty good. And today's episode is brought to you by Life Mastery School. It's a series of free videos by yours truly on my website, DennisBerry.com. Stop in and you can check out free videos on health and wellness, addiction recovery, love and relationships, and mindfulness and meditation. It's cool stuff. Check it out. Today, we have a great guest. She's a very well-known, accomplished athlete and award-winning author of the Amazon bestseller of the health book of the year, Quitting to Win, a proven plan to let go of bad habits, learn to feel and love yourself. And I love that so much. She shares her message of faith over fear and knows the value of taking care of herself so she can be of service to others. And I say that that's such an important thing in recovery. And one of the greatest gifts is to be able to take care of yourself so you can take care of others. But recovering out loud, she's been speaking for the last five years, sharing her experience, strength, and hope. She's a contributor to many different platforms, sobriety, fitness, and nutrition, and offers online courses as well. And I'll let her tell you more about that here shortly. Mrs. Crystal Waltman. How are you doing today, Crystal? I'm well, Dennis. Thanks for having me. Recovering out loud. I'd like to hear more about that. Can you please share with us a little bit about your story, like what it was like, what happened, what brought you to where you are today? Yeah. So um, after I went to my first meeting, I got sober, made it over a year. I did. I got sober through the step, the step program, and I had a really great sponsor. Ninety meetings, ninety days. I was so desperate that I just stopped everything in life, and I had to do that. Like that's how desperate I was. Everything was just on hold. So being an athlete. It's like, okay, give me the playbook. I can do this. You know, what I've been doing is not working. You know, not only is it not working, but it's hurting everybody around me. So then after a year, I was like, oh, I got this. My life's becoming manageable. I started thinking about drinking again, relapse. A couple of weeks, two, I think two to three weeks, I was ended up in the hospital again. Then I, you know, went back to the meetings and I was so ashamed. And they're like, we don't shoot our wounded. And they embrace me. And, you know, you don't hear those stories of relapse until, and like miscarriage or losing a kid or whatever, until you talk about it, people don't really share their stories with you because they've just overcome it or they already had healthy kids or now they're sober 30 years, you know, and they don't tell you, oh, I relapsed seven times before I got to that 30, right? So then my second time I started hearing all these stories, did the same thing, got at the playbook again, you know, went through the resentments and um, made all my amends. And, but I still felt like I was living a double agent life. I wasn't really, um, out with my alcoholism or wearing that label, um, had another relapse. And then after that, I said, well, I'm going to try this differently. Um, the anonymity part of it, and I'm just going to share with everybody around me and I'm going to write a book about it, you know, and I I'm a coach and I, I, I coach children at the school softball coach and stuff. And I always thought, you know, well, what if somebody hears this story, but I want them to hear it from me. Right. So I never thought I'd make it to the age of 40. And when I made it to the age of 40 now sober, I was like, you know, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to out myself. So it was my way of outing myself <laughs> because my life from the outside has been very well put together. And I was just dying on the inside and really living out loud and recovering out loud and sharing and speaking. And once I started that, I just started to uh, blossom, you know, like it just everything aligned. And it was like, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing with my message. You know, before I was just hiding, I was still being that double agent, you know? And so, you know, I'm proud of my past now. I have reconciled all of it and it made me who I am. I'm not shame, guilt, you know, let all that go. And then once you write it out, you write in a book, people are like, yeah, and so what? Yeah. (laughs) And then so for like all those years, you've been carrying that and you're like, what? That was so heavy. (laughs) Yes. So tell us about your book, Quitting to Win. Yeah. So it's part memoir, part self-help, but just starts off with my story. Um, I was an athlete at 14 years old. I started playing um, on the varsity team. We had a very competitive school. We won state. And my first blackout was our national, um, our state championship after we had won. And I started and played every game. And then, you know, so I was up with the 18 year olds and that was my first blackout drunk. And I think I had some social anxiety, like off the field, you know, on the field, I felt very confident, but when being off the field with older girls, I felt a little bit of uneasiness and then taking that drink and just zoom, it went away. 
And it was like, okay, this is my, you know, this is going to be my medicine. So high performer, good grades, and then zoom on the weekends, you know, just take all the anxiousness. And um, what I came to found out later, that was just social anxiety. Yeah. I think we all have that at a really young age and some of us, some people get to naturally learn how to navigate it younger. And I just never did alcohol. I thought helped me navigate it and weed and all that stuff, but I never learned how to feel. Right. Whether I was happy or sad, or as soon as I started to feel a little bit uncomfortable and then growing on as, as an adult, as soon as I start to feel a little bit uncomfortable, you know, I would take a drink just like numb, whatever that like nervousness was. But now, I mean, once you learn how to master the brain, right. And you learn that you're supposed to have those dopamines and all those natural drugs that your brain produces on its own, you don't, you don't need the synthetic ones. Right. And once you learn how to channel that, it is really just the keys to the kingdom. I mean, it's the, it's really unstoppable. Yes. I think uh, people do it in other ways too. You know, we're talking about alcohol and drugs, but people use, you can watch Netflix for six hours or you can what people watch porn or they go shopping with money they don't have and use credit cards, like all these distractions, things yeah. that to not have to feel. Yeah. It just lights up their brain in that same way of numbing exactly how they're feeling. Yeah. Now, when I start to feel it, I go, you know, I just kick in right to halt. Am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? And, and then if something plays in my head for longer than 10 minutes, I'm just programmed to pick up dial one of my sober sisters on speed dial, you know, one of my BFFs and say, Hey, this keeps running in my head, you know, <laughs> what is wrong? And then they help talk me through it. And then it passes, you know, yeah. and, it, and, and it's gone and it just passes. So having those tools and like your life mastery school, I'm sure has so many of those great lessons in it, you know, and it's really just such a great playbook for life. One of my early sponsors, he said to me, you know, Dennis, it's okay not to know as long as you know, you don't know. And I learned that early in business, like if somebody has something you want in business or how they get it, you know, you just ask them out to lunch and you say, how'd you get that? How'd you do that? You know, how did you get to that client or that level or that, you know, infrastructure of your business? But in feeling wise, I never had the tools to apply that, you mm -hmm. know, as, as of asking somebody like, oh, I'm feeling this. What does that mean? <laughs> How do I get over that? Or how do you, how do you channel it into positivity? You know, and that's really something I think we should be teaching the youth at a young age. Um, along those lines. So channeling into positivity. So share some of the tools, like how, how, what's a way that we can do something like that? All right. So I gave you the five halt, the, I mean, the halt, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And there's five things that I practice by every single day for mental health. And I've been preaching this over COVID pretty consistently and it's in my book. Um, but the five must of everybody before you do anything else is water because most people are walking around dehydrated and your brain, your systems, your, you know, all your systems are made up of water and your tissue. And if you're thirsty, then it's, it's not already too late, but just taking that drink, think about pouring water on a hard ground, how it's just going to roll off. So when it takes a couple of days to get back dehydrated, if you let yourself get dehydrated. So the best thing you can do is just, you know, sip on water all day. And if you're drinking anything else besides water, you really don't need it. Those high sugary drinks, you know, we just don't need that. So water is number one. Number two is sleep. Protect your sleep. Have good sleep hygiene. Be selfish in this way. Understand what sleep hygiene is. Don't be hacked by the smartphones or the screens or the light or noise, you know, put the moon on your phone. Um, mine kicks in to do not disturb 7 PM to 7 AM, you know, and then I just try to check my phone in certain times, but sleep is so important. And, you know, you have brain fog and a lot of times, you know, water, sleep, they just go hand in hand. You need sleep. You got to get into the cycle. So whatever your sleep cycle is, your sleep, you should have a sleep hygiene. And that means a, a good temperature, comfortable clothes, go through, a, you know, quick routine. It doesn't have to take that much. It can, it can be five minutes, but during the school year around here, it's almost like a bell. Like when the school starts, a bell goes off in my house and we just stop doing whatever we're doing. And we kick into our good night routine because it's that important, you know, nothing else. Like, no, we don't have to finish that. Sleep is more important. So we just stop and then start kicking into the good night routine. But even in it's summertime now and um, I have kids home and it's like, I'm still like, oh, sorry, got to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. 
I know you're on summer break, but I, I can't function tomorrow. My highest, you know, I'll, I'll burn out. You know, I just, you just can't do that. So water, sleep, food. And once again, like the sugars and stuff, they are slowly progressive diseases, lifestyle choices, diseases that just slowly crep up on you. You know, there's a term now called wheat belly. There's, you know, early onset diabetes and these young kids and th these young kids are overweight. And it's just, I mean, it should be against the law. It, it really should. And I think some laws are changing. So it's water, it's sleep, it's food, movement. Every day you got to move no matter what. Like even when you're tired, you think you're tired. It's one of those ways to get those natural drugs going. You know, you got to help your heart pump and move your body around. Even if it's just walking the dog, you know, push-ups, jumping jacks, you know, you don't need a gym. And that's another thing that came out of COVID is I think the people that went to the gym had a hard time with it, but then there was those office people that got outside and walked. Um, so it, it was pretty interesting, but movement every day, no matter what. And connection, connection with your higher power and connection with your friends, connection with God. I mean, those are the five things. So it's water, sleep, food, movement, connection, mental health, basics, no matter what, you can't go and be a high performer unless you have these five things as your foundation. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's all beautiful stuff. I, I, so simple. You know what? It is so simple. And if we were, like you said, I wish that we were taught this stuff at a young age as kids. We're, we're so programmed to do this life in this society that we live in, but this is life is actually it makes us sick. That's right. Life will make you sick if you just go with it without your boundaries. And it's, it's such a shame, but that's just the world that we live in today. And right now people are being hacked by, you know, the artificial intelligence It's coming into their, to their families. And it's once again, they're getting that slow addiction to their, to their phones or they're scrolling or they're touching, you know, and how do you become unhackable in this world where everybody wants attention you know, where they're paying for your eyes and your ears for attention. I mean, it's really wreaking havoc on families, but personally, you, uh, you know, you can't worry about the whole, unless you have to worry about yourself first. So all I can do is worry about myself, you know, put my phone down and do the next right thing. Yes. Ooh, so, that's one of my favorites. Uh, do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. The part two of my book is just shares all those basic tips, you know, seven minute stretches you can do at home. Yes. I teach yoga. Yes. I love to go to the gym and all that. And I'm um, like to train like an athlete, but I also broke my back um, just from high impact training. So after a year of sobriety, then I realized how much back pain I was in because I had been masking it with alcohol and pills. And, you know, if I didn't feel good, I would just have a drink and that would ease everything up. And so I realized how much back pain I was in. And um, so I went through back surgery, sober, right. Working with a naturopathic doctor and my surgeon to how to manage just pain pill medicine. I was so, so nervous to get surgery because you hear of people relapsing, you know, when they go to the, go to the doctor after they've been sober for a while. So, um, I think it's really common and that alcoholism causes, has a link to osteoporosis where it pulls on your bones, you know, so it's very common for people to get surgery after they become sober. And then how do you navigate that? You know, how do you not go back into that poor me state of just victim mentality? You know, something's happening to me and, and just thrive through it. So I share that in my book too, but it's, it's just surprising how many oh, back to your point where you're saying like your life, our lifestyle will make us sick. Yes. This right? world that we live in makes us the back. Sick. Cause the back pain. Well, a story I tell often is like, you know, when you go on vacation, you go to uh, like, I'm a beach boy. So I, it's like, you go on these beach vacations at the end or the islands, the, the lake, the mountains, wherever you go. And at the end, everybody says the same thing. Oh, it's back to the real world tomorrow. But this isn't the real world. This is the world that has everybody stressed out and fearful and on pills and all kinds of stuff. The one that makes us sick and is eating all the crap and on the electronics all day. So we have to spend a lot of money to go back to the real world where we belong and where we calm down instantly. I know. And most people go on vacation and don't really recover. You know, these days they use it as a drinking binge vacation and, you know, back to that self-care stuff or, you know, when people will post like they're drinking and then they post self-care, it's like, no, <laughs> you have it wrong. That's not things that, you know, replenish you and build you up. You know, self-care is things that replenish your body. Yeah, not that drain you. 
Yeah. Self-care, self-love, self-respect. Those are important things to know. And I love how you said that a lot of people, they go on vacation and they're not present. They're not present. They're thinking about what they have to do when they get back from vacation and they don't recover because they're drinking or they're eating sugar or they'll go on a diet for three months and not eat anything just so they can gorge oh, themselves for 10 days when they're on vacation. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's not self-love, self-care and self-respect. No, it's not. But awesome. these are all great life skill stuff. I just thank you so much for bringing you know, your message to all these people and creating this school with all these classes and where people have great resources and just such a simple, fun way. Yeah. And that's it. And I love doing like, really, we we're very blessed, fortunate, lucky, whatever you want to call it. But it's like, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I kick the sheets off, I kick the covers off and I'm like, my life, uh, like, who do I get to help today? Yes, yeah. but you know, there was there was 15 years where I was dying physically and emotionally dying every single day. I was 70 pounds heavier than I am now, dark circles under my eyes. And I have pictures to show you that. It was just a sad, awful life of dying and existing every day. And so, you know, I was able to turn it around. That's why we do what we do. I know that's why you do it too. You know, a lot of people, I challenge you, you know, if you're listening right now and you're laying in bed in the morning with the covers over your head and you're scared to get out of bed, I challenge that. What you, it's because you're not doing what you're meant to be doing. That's exactly right. You're, you're not in alignment, like your, your purpose with your passion, with your life, with your surroundings, all of it is out of alignment. Yeah. So outside of helping others, like with their own struggles, like the stuff we're talking about, what else inspires you? What makes you feel like your best self? My best self, I think is coaching. I, I love, you know, from being on the field to teaching a girl how to throw, which I consider a life skill <laughs> at the school, like that we barely have enough girls to field the softball team, but we'll get a ton of girls to come out for cheerleading. And I'm like, I'm the, I, I have this little speech. I say like, come out instead of, you know, get some dirt on your skirt instead of cheerleading, come out and learn how to throw. It's a life skill. Instead of being a bystander cheering on another team, like let's get inside the lines, you know, inside the dirt and get out there and play. But the, the course that I teach is called Inhackable. And it's basically my book weave with another message. It's a 30 day, but it's like, so you're sober. So what now, what, what are you going to do with that gift? You know, you've been given this gift. I was paralyzed for the first couple of years. Just being sober was all I could do. Once you get the keys to the kingdom and you've been sober for a while, it's like, now, what are you going to do with that gift? You know? And so that's where I really like helping people. Um, is how to close the gap between dreaming and doing and how to take action on it. I love the program and the steps. And those are really the steps for life that can be applied. It's really the best way of living, you know, the best design for life. And okay, but now what, what are you going to do with it? So let's take the next step. So yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. But I love that. What is it? Um, aligning? How did you say that? Aligning your passion and your purpose. And it's called your boon. It's your deepest calling, your darkest desire, you know, what's inside you and what's it cost if you don't do it. And, you know, who are you going to help when you do do it? And, you know, it's that feeling that you have when you wake up in the morning and you just can't wait to get up because you have so much to do so many people to meet and, and you know, so much message to carry and, you know, turning the mess into the message, right? Is yes. Makes yeah. it, that's the only thing that makes it worth it. <laughs> because yeah. Oh, well, I love it. And uh, you know, I think we had to be taught that. And I think I remember growing up with some friends that it seemed to me like they, they got that early on, like they just were more helpful and they, they stepped out of themselves and they were happy. And like, how can I help you and stuff? And I was like laying on the couch, watching TV and like my next door neighbor used to help my mother more than I did. And right, I, right. I look back and I'm like, God, I was just selfish. And I carried that into my adult years. Right. Yeah. It's not even something I realized until after I got sober. Yeah. And I think even probably more now than ever, the youth of our generation is being affected by technology. You know, there's a new term called digifrenia, and it means that you have digital schizophrenia and you try to be in two places at once. You have your digital self and your personal self. So digifrenia would be, for example, um, you're sitting at a family party with a millennial and they're more worried about their online profile or how they're appearing online versus how they're actually appearing in person. And so that's a new term called digifrenia. 
That you is heard good. it here first, folks. Digital you heard it here first, yeah. And another one is, these are the top two for the year, fubbing. Yeah, I've heard. What is that? Okay, phone snubbing. So if you and I were talking and, you know, we're face-to-face and we're in person and then the phone rings yes. or, or you're talking or I'm talking and then I just go down and start going to my phone. So that covers phone snubbing. So the etiquette of phone hasn't really translated into our digital phone because our digital phone is like an extension of our hand. So people act like, oh, just keep going. I'm listening, you know, and really you, you can't really do two cognitive things at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do we reset and not fub people? Like you said, it's, we have to teach that, start teaching that now at the kids, like, you know, I'll talk to my niece and she's awesome. Great girl. She just turned 17. We'll be having dinner and she'll take at least 30 or 40 pictures on um, Snapchat, right? Like we're talking and she's like doing her hair, psh, snap, picture, gone. And then she puts the <laughs> phone down and she and then she pretends to pay attention to what you're saying. And then one minute later, she's like, oh, picking up and taking another picture and sends it off with it, like going like this or a different expression or something like that. Yeah, that's not, a that's a minor. She's in a minor state of digiphrenia. Yeah, she totally not present at all. Right. Yeah. No I'm, mindfulness. I'm more worried about her digital self than her present self. Mm, interesting stuff. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much for sharing those two valuable terms. Fubbing and digiphrenia. Digiphrenia. Yes. Digital schizophrenia. Yes. Share with us a couple of positive inspirational words for anybody that like you were talking about it before, like somebody who's in a dark place and feels hopeless, like there's no way out. Like you were talking about your, uh, your back and like there was like periods of darkness and we all go through them, but we get, I think some of us suffer at a deeper level. We go into these states of darkness and we think we're never going to get out. So what are some tips that you can give to somebody who feels that way? Yeah. So I think it's really the pain of same or the pain of change. Because right now, if you're listening to this, if you're listening to Dennis, you, you could be in a lot of pain right now in whatever state of your life. And it's the pain of same or the pain of change. And then hackable people understand that they have to go through acute pain, but people who are being hacked are in chronic pain, whether it be emotional or physical. So I know that if I have to, you know, just get in this flow session to get this task done, that is short, acute pain, right? For the bigger picture. And then you're, and then you're out of it, but people are living in chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think, you know, if you're out there and you're in pain, either emotional or physical, just think about it, the pain of same or the pain of change. Yeah. Great stuff. I love that. Crystal, the book quitting to win. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So they can um, connect with me on all social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Facebook group, unhackable AF, which stands for unhackable alcohol free. Oh, is that what that stands for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, you can take uh, my unhackable course, Dennis, if it's okay with you, I'd like to give the readers, uh, you know, a free book, just pay for shipping. So you can go to Crystal Waltman dot com click on work with me and you'll see the book and you just play pay for shipping and you know we'll get connected that way and if you want to take a next step i'm here i'm accessible it's my honor and blessing to pick up the phone when you call thank you so much crystal awesome stuff everybody if you're listening please tune into crystal waltman Great stuff. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I appreciate it. It was great to meet you. And uh, thanks everybody for tuning into the Funky Brain Podcast. Have a beautiful day today. Talk to you soon. One of the most common questions I get is how do I become more successful? I see everybody else getting where they want to be in life, but I'm still stuck. There could be many reasons, but the main reason I find in people being stuck is lack of focus and of course, accountability. So there are three key steps to focused success. Number one is intention. Taking action with intention. Intentions should be extremely exciting and reasonable, not umbrella goals. They need to be realistic and achievable. Like if you're making 50 grand a year and you wanna make a million a year, that's probably not gonna happen right away. I'm not saying it's impossible, it's just probably not gonna happen next year. But what if we can get you to 100 grand next year? That would be double your income, that's awesome, right? And it's a huge achievement. Once we set these goals and we're intentional about the steps to get us there, then we have something concrete to work on. And now that's exciting. 
and they need to be in writing, not just in your brain. Remember, my brain is my problem. I think all the time, all over the place. I need to write them down and get them concrete. Now that's intention. The second step for focused success is gratitude. Create gratitude statements that are fun and passionate, but truthful and focused in reality. So if you're making 50 grand a year and you want to make 100 grand, then say, I'm grateful for the work I get to do to keep me living my life so I can get to my goal. I'm grateful for eating well and exercising so I can get to my goal of losing 50 pounds. I'm grateful for my kids, my partner, my house, my pool, my car. Stay in gratitude. There's no better way to stay positive and on track than living in gratitude. Third step for focused success is action. And action steps are everything. Let me repeat that. Action steps are everything. Once we clearly define our goal, our one thing, then we can create specific action steps to take on a regular basis to help get us there. And here's a huge piece. They must be uncomfortable or we cannot expect change. They cannot be effortless or there will be no change. Remember, the way that I've been doing things, my work habits, my drinking habits, my eating habits, whatever, they got me stuck here. So I need to do things a little differently than I have been doing or I probably won't see different results. I mean, think about it. If I could have achieved these things on my own, I probably would have by now. So these goals, they need to be measurable. They need to be put on a timeline. Monday at 10 a.m., I'm doing this. Tuesday at noon, I'm doing this. When I'm working with my clients, we have lots of homework. And when I ask them, when will you have this done? And they say something like, maybe by the end of next week, I say, uh, that's bullshit. Please have that to me by tomorrow morning, tomorrow by dinner at the latest. This is how you get results. The old you without an accountability partner would say, maybe by the end of next week and then nothing would ever get done. That's how we got stuck here in the first place. Does that make sense? So hopefully some of this rings true with you and you're ready to make drastic changes in your life. If you don't know where to begin or if you're looking for that push to get you to the next level, please reach out. Give me a call and set up a free session to start radically changing your life forever. The most satisfactory years of your life lie ahead. Life isn't over, it's just starting. I'll talk to you soon. Have a beautiful day today.